Okay, I told you that from time to time I would, there we go, I would give you some tidbits of uh, things you can do. Um, last week I made a mistake, last tape. I made a mistake, and, I, and as I was introducing the new test, I realized this is the wrong order to do things. Okay, let's do the whole traditional way and then go back and see what the new stuff is done. I, I, I blew it, right? And you saw I put that, that slide up about the new test and I took it right down. And everybody who's taking a live said, wait a minute, we didn't get a chance to copy it. So I went home and I said, I have to find some ways. I'm going to call up people who are in charge of this to edit the tape because it's going to go several semesters. But I'm not going to do it. Instead, I'm going to do this, right? You're going to make mistakes. The worst thing to do, when, one of the bad things to do when you're teaching, I don't know, it's the worst, is to bluff and to pretend and to try to cover. First, if you don't know something, tell the kids you don't know. I'll never forget the time that um, we were, I grew up in, in Rochester, New York, or in the suburb, but at the time I was a fourth guy, I was actually in Rochester, and they were talking about Nathaniel Rochester, the person who founded the town, and they said how there were some other small towns around there, Webster and Greece, a few other towns. So, and this was in fourth grade, and I said, I got up and asked the teacher, well, if there are other, were other towns around, why did Nathaniel Rochester feel the need to found this one? And instead of saying, gee, I really don't know, I'll look it up. She said, I don't know, when I see him, I'll ask him. Okay? Isn't that funny? I remember this. It was 10 years ago. I was 10 years old. It was over 50 years ago. So it, it, you shouldn't do things like that. Okay? Th there was a reason, by the way, because those were farming communities, and he wanted to set up a, a mill. Right? Instead of shipping the stuff to another town, he said, let me put up a, a mill to grind the wheat here. West New York grew a lot of wheat then. And it was found on a river which had f natural falls, and he used the, uh, the, the, the water power to uh, you know, turn the mill. So uh, the Genesee River. I told you about the river flowing north. That was the river. So there was an answer. She just didn't know, so she tried to do it. If you make a mistake, you have to admit you know a mistake. It's tough because we're sort of in this mistakeless mode, right? Get the right answers on the test, doesn't matter why. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, uh, uh, you're going to have people who are going to say, if you go to them and admit you made a mistake, it's going to not be to your benefit. One of the best principles I ever knew, I'm sitting in this office talking to him about doing my uh, thesis, you know, an experiment, and the teacher comes in and said, I blew it. Can you help me to do it better next time? Okay? And he said, yeah, it's okay. And I said, no, you, you're a great principal. In fact, the teachers can come to you. But in your own hearts, if you will, you should, if you blow it, admit it. Say, you can tell it to the students, right? Or you can just go on. So I blew it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over the old tests and, uh, the way it was until a couple of years, year or two, so year or two, few years ago. I don't know how long this tape is going to run. And then I'm going to show you how the new tests work. Okay, so let's go to the PowerPoint. And we had talked about what was wrong with the IQ test. I'll give you a hint right now. Nothing is going to change when it comes to the new test. Okay, nothing is going to change. So they're going to have the same problem. The first thing we talk about is age being a valid criterion. Uh, I, I, um, come back to me for a second. I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how devastating a critique this is from the point of view of any psychologist. Age doesn't tell you anything. We know that all normal nine-year-olds can do almost anything better than all, all normal four-year-olds, and that all normal 15-year-olds can do almost any intellectual task better than all normal nine-year-olds, or many, many of them. So why, right? And we know that there are perfectly normal variations in age. It is foolish to think the kid who talks earlier will be the greatest orator, right? That the kid who reads, reaches puberty sooner will be the greatest athlete or the greatest lover, if you will. It's just silly. It's silly. And yet here, they're, they're, they're like there's a, 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 like a fixation on age. Nine years, three months, nine years, six months, nine years, eight months. Which age is the kid? If the, depending on what the answer is, that kid has a different IQ. The second thing we, we pointed out is that the assumption of this test is that people have a standard environment. Now I know we were at the end of the tape. And so let me go over this quickly again. The, look. In order to assume that the differences in answers on the test are not due to different backgrounds, to different things that we learned, we're going to have to assume that everyone has had exactly equal exposure to the items. 
Otherwise, I can claim, well, big deal. TJ's, you hear TJ? Yeah, there he is. TJ's parents gave him books to read. My parents didn't. That's why he knows more words than I do. TJ's parents read to him about all kinds of stuff and gave him all kinds of books about facts and history. And I know that he had a teacher who was really interested. My parents didn't, and my teacher didn't really care too much about the stuff that's on an IQ test. That's why he knows more than I do. I'm really a lot smarter than he is. Well, it's a, it's a, how do you know? You'll never know. Okay? Because we know that children's environments are not the same. So, therefore, there's no way to know why there's a differential on, on questions that are asked on the test. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can always say, well, it's innate, it's learned, it's a little of each, it's this and that. How do you know? It's very clear that the quickest way, come back to me for a second, the quickest way to have a child's IQ go down. If you have a child who has an IQ of 120 in the third grade when he's 10, today's a he day, I don't know they're broadcasting it, when he's 10, and then that, that child drops out of school and never is exposed to any school, experiment, school material again, when the child's 15 or 60, IQ is going to be way down, obviously. The math questions, the child's not going to be able to answer. The, the information questions, the trivial pursuit questions, the child's not going to be able to answer. Probably will have a hard time answering things, how are a banana and a pickle the same, right? Similarities. We'll probably have a very difficult time because those are things that are practiced and exercised in school. If the child is not exposed to puzzles and the kinds of things, word games as the child's never seen a crossword puzzle, in general, verbal, verbal uh, 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 performance is going to be down. Same thing is even true with puzzles, the what they call the object assembly. But, so it's clear that, that much of this test is based on achievement, much of it. And there's no way to know how much of his achievement, how much is quote unquote innate ability. As a matter of fact, the whole conception of innate ability is, is a very strange one. Okay? So let's go back here. It's impossible to know how much knowledge a child is due to environment and how much is due to heredity, or if any is due to heredity. Okay, so that's another problem with these tests. You don't really know what they're testing. That's a validity problem. A third problem with these tests is the assumption that performance is a sufficient measure of intelligence. Okay? And this is, a, this is an objection that is made most vociferously by developmental psychologists. Uh, and if you see the first article, which I did not assign to the undergraduates, you'll see this is one he makes. It's a little tough, but you see, here's the idea. Look, IQ tests, come back to me for a second. IQ tests ask you what's the answer and assume the answer is the right answer. They never ask you, how did you get the answer, right? So if there's a kid who's asked, you buy something for 90 cents and give the clerk a dollar, how much, is it, how much change will you get? And the kid says two cents, it's just marked wrong. But if we would ask the kid, and the kid's 10, he might say, well, I figured in the tax. And he knows the tax on 90 cents is eight, is, is eight cents wherever he happens to be living. It's not wrong, but you don't know. Okay, IQ tests, let's go back to the PowerPoint. IQ tests assume that the right answer provides is sufficient information to measure intelligence or anything else. Every standard I test assumes that. The right answer gives you enough information. But is intelligent, so what developmental psychologists and others ask is, is intelligence only how much we know? Or is there more, right? Is intelligence mainly something else altogether? Okay, and most people would tell you that they believe that at least in part, Intelligence represents how you figure out the answers, okay? Not just getting the right answer. One question, let him sue me, on, Dar on, on an old IQ test is, who was Charles Darwin? If you say he's a biologist, you got half credit. If you say he invented the theory, he came up with a theory of evolution, you got full credit. So one time we used to have a clinic on campus. It's gone now. Uh, Diagnostic Learning Center, it was called. And there was one kid, he got it right. He said, Dar and he said it like this, Darwin is the man, Dar Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin, theory of evolution. It was like he was going through. 
like you've been memorizing something for a test, right? So I said, hmm. So I got the kid afterwards. I said, what's the theory of evolution? And I got the classic, right? Most kids that, he was about 10. It was amazing that he knew the answer, right? And he said, no words. He goes, hmm, right? That's all the I said, well, what does the theory of evolution have to do? He said, I don't know. I said, does it have to do with plants, animals, or things? I don't know. He had no idea what it was. It's something he had memorized. I had a suspicion his parents might have known what the test was on the test, but it didn't matter. He didn't know what it was. He didn't know what it meant. Right? I can have people, I used to be a history teacher, so I bring a lot of examples from history. I can say, look, sit, list the six causes of the Civil War, right? And you can put down the six, co six causes of the Civil War. There are more that people, six causes that people have said caused the Civil War, okay? And you could list economic differences. That's right. But if I said, you can explain to me the difference in the economics that caused this war, and you can't, and you just can't, so do you really know or do you not know? If you can do multiplication problems and you don't know when to multiply, do you know or do you not know? And in the end, what if you come up with an answer that's not the answer that the bureaucrat who made the test wants? Maybe it's a good answer. I'll give you an example. I was doing a Piagetting test. We'll get to that about conservation. A kid, I had two cups of water. Kid looks at He's 11 years old. He looks and he says, I said, I want you to tell me when the water's the same. So he says, okay, it's the same. Then I took one cup of water and I poured it into a flat, low dish. I said, okay, they're still the same as one head more. I was sort of, I was actually going to do tests for him for higher level thinking, but you have to establish a baseline that he can think, you know, with regular, regular, normal logic, what P.I.V.C. calls concrete operational logic. He says, I think there's less than the one that you, there's less in the dish than in the cup. I almost fell out of my chair. He's 11 years old. So I said to him, well, how do you figure? This is his answer. This is almost, it's, it's not a quote, but it gives you the tenure. He said, well, assuming that my initial experiment, my initial evaluation in the absence of any instruments will just make the assumption that it was absolutely correct and that they were absolutely equal, then when you poured the water, clearly some molecules of water, due to friction and other reasons, stuck to the glass in which the water init was initially contained. This is how he's talking, right? So there's still some mo water molecules left behind on the old glass, so there must be left in the some st less in what, what's now been poured, okay? Which is very different from what pre-operational kids say, oh, there's less because it's lower, right? Because I poured it into a dish and made it go lower. Oh, uh, that kid could think just fine. So the answer he gave was typical for a five-year-old. But his reasoning was the reasoning of someone much older. We don't get any reason. We don't even know why. And if you don't know why the person got the answer, how the person got the answer, how do you know how intelligent the person is? Next problem, scholastic validity. This is a biggie. You saw it in one of the in, uh, Asa Hilliard's articles. By the way, for those of you, Asa is a man's name. Asa is a he, not a she, OK? Scholastic validity says, in order to give any credence to IQ tests or measure of intelligence, you have to assume that they measure something important. That all the information, pro that all the, the trivial pursuit is important. To be able to put a get together a puzzle is important. That being able to make designs out of blocks is important. That being able to recognize an idiot, a, 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 a shape, right? Here, come, let's go to the tablet, that when you see can we go to the, when you see this, put one. When you see this, put two. When you see that, put three. I mean, these aren't the real ones, but you get the point, right? Okay? That that's imp somehow that's important. Okay? So come back, come back to the PowerPoint now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, okay? That somehow they measure something important. The question is, do they? All right? It's a very simple question. You have to ask whether the questions asked on these tests are what you think of as being intelligence. Is that what you think of as being intelligence? Right? 
Most of you, when we took the vote, at least in this class, said no. Okay? And so if your answer is no, then you have a serious reservation about whether these tests measure anything that you consider intelligence to be whether they're val valid. Which means we have serious doubts whether these tests would measure what you mean by intelligence. Remember that when you're teaching. Okay, come back to me for a second. Okay, there's another problem here. This little, go to the tablet for one, just a second. This test that I gave you is considered to be a test of short-term memory. Right? Because if, if you have to keep, okay, looking up to see which is a one, which is a two, oh, this is a one, this is a two, this is a three, come back to me now, then obviously it'll take you longer to do it and you have less time. But the question is, is it? Does remembering what a bunch of meaningless symbols mean, to take what the numbers assigned to a meaningless symbol, does that have anything to do with what real people remember in real situations with real tests that are of importance? real tasks that are of importance to them. And the answer is nobody knows. They didn't do an experiment. I can say what I'm going to do is go flipper, dibber, gibber, libber, hoopy doopy, zoopy, loopy. And then you say all those things after me. Right? If you can do it, you have a great memory. If you can't, you don't. Huh? Really? Are you sure that that's really a good test of whether I can remember the real things in my life that are important to me? And of course, even, uh, there's no way to know. I, I, I have my doubts. No one's ever done an experiment to find out whether it's true, or certainly not a series of experiments to see whether it's true. And finally, you have to ask yourself, is being absent-minded a sign that you're not intelligent? Because you can't remember things. Einstein once said, I never bothered to memorize anything I can look up. Is being able to remember isolated facts in the information section, the Trivial Pursuit game, right? We have, is that a sign of intelligence? I, I, I have my doubts, I have to tell you the truth. Next, the next objection that people have consistently made about these tests, you ha they're assuming that if this is measuring your intelligence, then this is a complete test of your intelligence. Give me a break. If we say these tests measure intelligence, they ought to measure everything that goes into intelligence. Okay? And from the beginning, people have said, baloney, that's just not true. Okay? They don't measure music abilities. They don't measure artistic abilities. They don't measure social skills. They don't measure decision-making abilities. Okay? Let me give you an example. Okay? Um, any, anybody here like math? Yeah, tell me your name. Push it down. Allison. Allison, right. I know she's told me three times before. I don't care. Okay? So Allison decides that she's going to, she likes math, and she's changed her mind. She gets her degree, and she goes, she majors in math, and she goes, and she gets, goes into accounting. Okay? Gets her master's degree in accounting, becomes a CPA, and she's the most brilliant accounting student they ever had. Okay? She takes the CPA exam. She gets the highest score in the history of the CPA exam. She's magnificent. Then Allison goes out on a job interview. And the interview, they're dying to have her. They see, wow. So they take her for a tune and they show her their accounting procedures. And she's interviewing with the president of the company. And the president of the company says to her, um, well, Allison, uh, what do you think? And Allison says, who designed these accounting procedures? That person must have been an idiot. So the president says, well, as a matter of fact, I had a lot to do. He said, well, you made terrible mistakes. This is ridiculous. You hire me, and I'll show you how to correct everything that you screwed up. Uh, and you think Allison's going to get the job? Uh, probably not, right? There's a lack of what some people would call social intelligence there. You want to make a change in the procedures? That's not how to go about it. Two of my sons in high school, one of them, when the teacher had a rule, he could push the rule a millionth of an inch. Look the rule in. Teacher did it, he pushed another millionth of an inch, right? A little bit more, pushed another millionth of an inch. And the teacher objected, 
push back, he had his two millionths of an inch, right? The other one, bang, a giant step over the line. Go to the principal, go to the office, get out, all right? It's just a stupid rule. I mean, they both thought it was a stupid rule, but one knew how to handle it and one didn't, okay? The second one learned finally, okay? So that's mu musical intelligence, artistic intelligence, social, social intelligence, right? And social intelligence is even more than that. There, there, there's somebody named um, um, Gardner who talks about interpersonal intelligence and intrapersonal intelligence. Have you ever known anyone who was just wonderful at looking at other people, seeing the dynamics that was between them, analyzing it, and often able to help, right? Seeing, you know, this is destructive behavior, you ought to stop doing it. Could really give you good advice. And completely screwed up his or her own life. Could never make an indecent decision about his or her own life, even though it was had a lot of insight into other people's lives. Gardner would say that person has a lot of interpersonal intelligence, but very poor intrapersonal intelligence. Right? Okay. He's even got one intelligence about the environment. Right? That's a new one he's coming. We had eight kinds, now he's got a ninth kind of intelligence. So these tests are clearly incomplete, and we know why. Because their, their roots are in Binet, which said, what about school? Look. It must be clear to you that there are certain kinds of things schools value and certain kinds of things they don't. So people have dyslexia, ooh, can't read. People have dyscalculia, ooh, can't do math. Nobody has, ooh, dystonia, you can't do English. Dysthrosia or dyskixia, you can't play sports. By the way, sports is another kind of intelligence that's left out of here, right? Just like the coach said to me, you're okay individually. When it comes to putting together this game together, you can't figure out what it's about, right? Nobody has dystonia because you can't do music. Dysdrosia. Why? Well, it's very clear why. Because math is more important in our society than music. You turn on the radio, station after station has math equations, right? Not music. All right? I mean, it's, it's nuts, right? Music is around us everywhere. The schools don't seem to care too much. Geometry, plane geometry. How many people here pass plane geometry? Almost everybody. How many people have used it more than twice in your life since you passed it? One person. Are you a math teacher? Push it down. What did you use now, it for? I had to do a project and I used their equations to draw a picture. Very good. That's once. <laughs> I said more than twice. I admit I used it once. Yeah, go ahead, what do you use it for? I sell paint, so I gotta find the area of a lot of like rooms and stuff, so. All right, well, finding areas is not geometry. That's sort of, yeah. I used it once, once I had a bookshelf that went like this, and I remembered, oh, side, side, said, if I put a, a vertical place in the back, I'll have triangles, and then triangles, right, there's only one triangle that makes side, 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 once in my life, okay? I have to admit, somebody reminded me, okay, <laughs> that it didn't sway. I mean, you don't, so you have to ask yourselves about, you know, there's all kinds of intelligence that come about, right? All right, so clearly these tests are very limited in scope, okay, and don't measure a lot of kinds of things, okay? Let me say one other thing about them, okay? Never mind. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. The next one, the assumption is that all the subtests measure the same underlying ability. Why is there that assumption? We already talked about it, we're gonna do it again. Look, let's do some fifth grade math, okay? Some of you it was fourth grade math. We can only average items that are alike. Thank you very much, ooh, that was a nice one, once more. I don't know how to do that anymore, okay? Averages of unrelated items have no meaning, right? We already pointed that out. So, if we're going to average the scores a person receives on a test of math and a test of knowledge and a test of putting together puzzles and a test of making designs out of blocks and a test of, I don't know, whatever else is on there, a test of 
taking frames from cartoons and putting them together, we're going to have to assume they all measure the same thing if we're going to add them up and get an average. If they don't measure the same thing, it's just complete nonsense to average them and compute a standard score. Okay? It's just foolishness to do that. If you think that the test, the ability to do math, is a different mental ability to do, do a puzzle, is a different mental ability that they're measuring different things, how can you add them up? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Do you think that math tests, vocabulary tests, general knowledge tests, tests ability to do puzzles, tests ability to build designs from blocks, etc., all measure the same ability? If you don't, then you're saying that you don't think the total IQ score has any meaning. Okay, come back to me. Look, this is what Hilliard's article was saying. This is the point. I have a person. Tell me your name, person. This is a... Go ahead, person. Amisha. Again, a little louder. Amisha. Amisha. Okay, here's Amisha. Amisha, wave your... Raise your... Go ahead. Raise, there she is. See her? Got to wave to your fans. Okay. Now, Amisha has all different kinds of abilities. Wait, I almost know your name. Shiva. Shiva, right? Yeah. Shiva has all different kinds of abilities. How many people are ready to bet that there are some things Amisha does better than Shiva and something Shiva does better than Amisha? How many people are ready to bet that there's probably something they share that the two of them do better than most people. And there's something that the two of them do be worse than most people. Everybody, right? Everybody's voting, obviously. Obviously that's true. So they all have, there's unique abilities, unique approaches, unique, unique ways to do things. Right? All kinds of mental abilities in all different kinds of areas. And you're going to add all that up and make one number out of it? That's what that's what the article you read means by saying you take a multidimensional kind of a kind of an ability. It's a, there's out here and in there, all different kinds of ways and problems, right? And try to put it on a single number line. Oh, she's a 115 and she's a 113 and she's a 106 and she's a 92, sorry, and she's 147. <laughs> I mean, what's going on here? And most of you know, most of you will be ready to bet that there's something the person with a 92 can do better, understands better, than the person who has a 126. I know a guy who was, was living in Israel. He had dropped out of school. So I went to the body shop where he had a job. And I'm trying to convince the employer to tell him to go back to school. The employer told me to, basically told me to drop dead, right? He was like in ninth grade. And this was, in Israel at that time, cars cost, uh, like in today's money, uh, 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 a Volkswagen would cost, you know, $35,000. Heavy taxes, all kinds of stuff. So you fix cars and fix cars. He said, this guy, he said, it takes him one-third of the time to pound out a fender that's been damaged than anyone else. I said, I said, we go around, pound, 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 pound. He said, the kid takes, he hikes up, puts it up on the jack, he looks, he looks. He said, I don't know what he does. He goes, bang, 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 and it's 90% done. Just has this feel about where to hit it to get it out. That looks like a form of intelligence to me. I might add, by the way, <laughs> that this guy charged less to fix cars, and there were two other places in the town where I was living, <laughs> because <laughs> this kid could do it much faster. He said, I make more money. So he told me, get out. He said, I charge less and make more because of him. Get out. <laughs> right? So I don't know what he's doing now, but I couldn't get him to go back to school. He dropped out of middle school, eighth grade. Couldn't get him back. Okay. He would always he was supposed to have been in the ninth grade. I, I had his name. I was trying to get him to go back. So intelligence and, and abilities are very complex. Where they come from is very hard to know. To put it all on one number is, is silly. And as I as I hinted before, since these tests have come out, people have griped about that. Gardner has eight, now nine kinds of intelligence. Guilford had 120, then his followers had 160 kinds of intelligence. Okay? And it's very clear to people that these tests test certain kinds of abilities and not others, even thinking. When you're told, don't think too much, when you're told the answer's enough, I don't want to know how you got it. They're talking about here. Let's go to the, let's go to this. Uh, 
over the tablet. There we go. These tests measure what Guilford calls convergent thinking. Probably should stay in the lines. That would help you read it, huh? Rather than divergent thinking. Convergent thinking, you can get where it comes from. It means to converge on the right answer. Get my picture in there or come back to me or whatever. Come back to me. That'll be enough. That can be, okay, that's good. You converge on the right answer. You get the right answer, right? How much is 7 plus 9 take away 2? I don't know. What is it, 12? I can't get it. All right. 14? Okay. Divergent thinking is... How many different ways are there to solve this problem? Come back to me now, okay? How many different ways to solve this problem? But you might notice, by the way, that computers reward divergent thinking. How many people, okay, here's, here's my, I used to call it a thumb drive, now they call it a flash drive, right? Yeah, I have a tape, okay. How many people, if you were going, if you had something on your mainframe, on your uh, a desk, on your laptop. Let me try this again. If you had one on your PC, on your regular computer, and you plug this in, and you wanted to copy it onto here, how many people would call both, both um, disks up and drag it from one to the other? Who'd drag? How many people would just save it to the other disk? Is there another way to do it? There must be several. There's another way to do it, isn't there? How else would you do it? Go ahead. Push it down, push it down, push it down. Right click, send to. Right click, send to. How many people right click, send to? Nobody? That would be, by the way, that would be my second choice. Saving it to one Dixon, saving it to the other, I don't know why. It gets on my nerves. I don't like it. So there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. You will often see my brother for many years was a debugger. You know, they make programs and they, they, they debug them. Okay? And he and another person were given, there was a huge program, and they gave it to a couple of debuggers, and, and, and they came on the same bug in two different places. My brother debugged it one way, and the other guy debugged it another way. Okay? They were thinking, thinking. Both of them claimed, each of them claimed that he had seen it the other way, but thought his way was better. Okay, I know that because my brother said, the company thought my way was better. And it's of course they're a bunch of bureaucrats, they don't know what they're doing anyway. But, okay, it didn't matter. It was cheaper to do it his way is what it boiled down to, right? <laughs> so the other guy said his way was more elegant. So, but, okay, so there are many ways to skin a cat, many things to do, many different ideas to have. To come in on the right answer, right? And, of course, divergent thinking, let's go back to the, let's go back to the, thank you, creativity requires divergent thinking. The ability to come up with something new and creative requires not getting the same answer you got before. Right? And some people have said that IQ tests and in general standardized tests, they squash creativity. Or, come back to me, or as you were, many of you were told, don't think too much when you get in there. You already told me that, that you heard that. Don't think too much. Don't be creative. Don't think, well, it could be this, it could be that. Try to think about what's going on. And as a matter of fact, try to get into the mind of what the tester wants. You'll see one of the new tests that's, that's crucial. Okay? And so these tests, they penalize creativity. They penalize convergent thinking. And there are other kinds of thinking. Guilford said there are many different kinds of thinking. For instance, some people can think very well. For instance, when it comes to analyzing literature, I'm pretty good. When it comes to analyzing words and grammar, I'm, I'm good. When it comes to math, I wouldn't say I stink, but I wouldn't say I'm, I wouldn't I wouldn't go as far as pretty good. I'm all right. I can get through the math classes somehow. In the history, of the, I read it, I read it. I loved to diagram sentences. Who else loved to diagram sentences? You can admit it, right? One other person. Who, who hated it like poison? Really? Who could do it and didn't care too much? Was that? Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. Okay? 
Well, that was a certain, when it came to math stuff, here's the, co here's the computational formula. This was in, I was already a doctoral student. Here's the computational formula. Here's the theory behind it, and here's the formula we used to compute. Show how we can turn the regular formula into the computational formula by mathematical stuff, right? I did one, I got it all the way, and I couldn't get the last step. The professor comes to me and says, all you have to do is this one more division thing, and you'd see it. I couldn't see it. Couldn't get it. I said, oh. I mean, he said, how could you get so far? How could you be so much on the right track and then just blow it? I said, that's life. <laughs> okay. So different areas, in different areas, different abilities can come out. It's quite possible that I cannot do that memorizing of those squiggles to save my life. But if it had been colors, I'd be the best one you could have. Associate a color with a number, I'd be tops. It's a different area. Okay, another one. Another assumption, let's go to, let's go to here. The test taking abilities of people are equal. Come back to me for a second, I'm gonna tell you a story. Did I tell you the story about being a mechanic in the Israeli army? Did I tell you this? I don't think I did. I wasn't. Uh, I did my master's degree in Israel. So the first semester I was there, first year I was there, but it was the first semester, I take a course in measurement. And the professor hands out a test to show, admittedly, what a bad test is. And it was a test given to mechanics in the Israeli Air Force. And it graded you. Mechanic level one, top, mechanic level two, and mechanic, you know, okay, and mechanic level three, we could basically assist the other mechanics until you got there, okay? And this was deadly serious business. I have the word deadly, right? This was, I was doing this in 69 or 70. It was right after the Six Day War, and which, and, and the entire country was convinced that the only thing between us and the total destruction is our Air Force, okay? And the, and the training for mechanics and pilots was intense intense and one of the ways that Israel maintained had maintained parity it had less planes than, than the countries around it all of whom were sworn enemies at the time no more fortunately um, was that its airplanes were fixed faster and could be you could have more airplanes in service and the ones who went out of service got back in service faster than the norm okay I knew one guy who was a mechanic he said when, when he, there was an American General, the American military attaché, who saw it, he couldn't believe it. How quickly things were done. You had to be tippy tippy top to be a mechanic. So this test was given for deadly serious business. So he passes out the test, and he immediately said, "It's a horrible test." And the test, of course, is in Hebrew. My Hebrew at that time was like it is now. Eh. Eventually, it got good, and I've been away. I got it. It was all right. I could understand things. I could read it okay. But there were words I didn't understand. This and three people in the class qualified as mechanics. Three. Two qualified as mechanics grade one, and they were. That's what they had done in the army. Okay, in Israel, you go to the army, and then you go to college, right, if you're going to go to college. They really were grade one mechanics, and me. I qualified as a grade three mechanic. Right? And I said to the professor afterwards, if the thing had been in English, I think I could have made grade two, because there were some questions I just didn't understand, right? I couldn't even understand the, 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 you know, the, the logic of the question, or words I couldn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't get what they meant. And he said, I have no doubt. Now, the test was a horrible test. It would say like this. When the flins and banger breaks, you use a hoots, a poots, or a doots to fix it. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about, right? Five, you know... The next page, if the dutes falls into the flinzenbanger, you get it out by doing ABC. Oh, I go back to that one. It's dutes, right? So admittedly, it was an awful test. He was pointing it out to show how it's an awful test, and it was really testing. But only I was able to take advantage of that. I was the only one who was able to exploit the fact that the test gave away the answers, that some of the answers were so ridiculous ridiculous, right? Like they give, they ask you a question, right? How long does it take to fix a so-and-so? 14 years. That's wrong. I'm exaggerating only a little. 
three minutes. That can't be right. So I would pick from the other two, right? Five hours, two hours, how long should it take? Oh, you know, you have enough of those, you get half of them right, right? Because I was test wise, I was test sophisticated. They didn't have any tests like this in Israel at the time. Well, very few, except here and there. They didn't have any of them in their schools. I was an American. I was used to these tests. I was from New York State, where the final tests were, you know, there were, were statewide tests. We already talked about that. I really was what they call here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. There's a concept in psychology called test wiseness or test sophistication. Okay, I was very test sophisticated. Some people are good at taking tests. And on a standardized test, a test-wise person may do better than a person of equal, even great ability who is not test-wise. Right? There are people who took mechanics courses in the Israeli army who failed that test the first time around. They knew something about airplane mechanics. I knew nothing and still don't. But I passed the test because I knew how to take tests. IQ doesn't take that into account. I assume everybody says, how many, well, for instance, okay, come back to me. I'm going to show you. I'm giving you the test. Remember, there are some items where the faster you do it, the more points you get, right? Okay, make this design out of these blocks. Tick, 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 tick. Not so tick. How many people would freak out if you know you're being timed? Five or six. How many people probably would make that much difference? And how many people would do better if you know you're being timed? It's one of the three choices. We're voting again. Who would probably do worse, knowing you're being timed? Ooh, most of you. Who would probably, it wouldn't make that much difference. And how many people would do better? Yeah, I would probably, I, I, for me it depends. If it's something I feel confident in, I do better if they're timing me. If something I have no confidence, I just freak, right? It's, I'm gone, okay? That kind of thing. How many people in general, when you take a test, you feel that the grade on the test underestimates your ability? And how many people think it probably overestimates? How many people do better on tests than they should? How many people think that, that, that you're not good test takers and the test scores underestimate your abilities? How many people think they overestimate? It's about half and half. How many people think it's about right? <laughs> that's almost nobody, right? It's almost invariably, that's what happens. No. Okay, come back to me. So you can see that the ability to take tests is very important. Some people are good at it, some people are not. Even though IQ tests are given one and one, some people are, are quite good at it. They don't panic. And, and I've seen it. One of my sons takes the, he doesn't care. The other one, he goes nuts. He goes nuts. And I might add, by the way, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to, kind of going forward with what you were talking about, I, I was curious. Most of us, or at least some of us, if we have a child that has a problem or even one that's excelling, uh -huh. you sometimes want to investigate what's going on with them. And you want to see what it is. And as of right now, all we have is the IQ test. Is there a move or a right. push to do something else, to find some other means? That's to what the rest of the course is going to be about, okay? We'll get, that's what the rest of the course is going to be about. By the way, one of my sons just freaked out on tests, particularly math tests. And I sent him to the Princeton Review. I don't know if I'm doing a commercial or not. And what he basically did, they teach you how to take tests. They don't teach you. This is for the SAT. You can also do it for the GRE, by the way, if some of you want to go on to school. They don't teach you any of the material on the test. They just teach you how to take tests and how to become test-wise. His score went up 100 points on one test, 100, maybe. 100 points on one test from the first time he took it and 150 on the other. That time they didn't have an analyst. They just had, they just had uh, math and, and verbal. He didn't know anymore. He just knew how to take tests better. So whether a test is reliable is also... You know, here, let's go to test taking. Let's go to the uh, PowerPoint again. Okay, what about personality? Some people get nervous on tests and some don't. Some children have different levels of interest in taking the test. By the way, some kids will be, oh, this person has a problem. They've been tested and tested and tested and tested. They're, they're sick of it. They can't stand it anymore. They just bad, 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 bad their way through the test. They don't care anymore. They've taken a million tests. Doesn't seem to make any difference. They still don't do so hot in school. The hell with it. Your mood on a given day can affect the test. These are just a one-time snapshot. They'll tell you that. So if it's a one-time snapshot, how are you making a decision about the kids' rest of the kids' lives? 
right? You know there's some days you go into a test and you just feel, you're just down about it or you an have anxiety about something else, okay? It's a one-time test given by a person who's never seen the child before, a really an accurate reflection of consistent performance. I was talking to someone the other day who showed me tests from her child, just the other day, come back to me, and it was very clear to me, and it was an IQ test that was much lower than any other IQ test the kid had had. I read what the tester said. It was very clear to me. The tester just completely failed to have rapport with the child. Oh, the kid won't cooperate, and the kid, the kid is not paying attention. I, I said, that's obvious. This, this test could not maintain rapport with the child. It was obvious. You know, he, he sort of gave it away. Even if I'm wrong, it certainly was a reasonable hypothesis. Couldn't get the kid to sit and take the test. The test was not in any kind of accurate measure of how much the kid knew on that test. So you have to be very careful about these things. Okay, I want to say one more thing um, about these tests. It's not on here. IQ and race. Race. Okay. As in black and white. Okay, first let me tell you something. The whole concept of race is a non-scientific concept. It's a social concept. Okay. So I don't have a heck of a lot of use for it. I'll tell you right now, when I, they fill out forms and they ask me my race, I put down human. Okay, that's really the only accurate number. Okay, I'm, I'm going to depress myself. Now, does anybody know who Roy Campanella was? Oh, my, I'm going to cry. Roy Campanella was the three times most valuable player in the National League. And by the way, he was a catcher for the Brooklyn and then the L.A. Dodgers, and he, he got into a terrible car wreck and became paralyzed from the waist down, and he actually spent the last few years of his life, because he was very famous in, in the 50s and 60s, became very famous. Uh, he was very famous, so he spent his year campaigning uh, um, for, the, for the handicapped. Not let's use any more disabled, handicapped, I don't know why, but the correct term. And he, you know, he, and then he, he died young, but, uh, you know, so he, and, uh, Anybody know who Franco Harris? Franco Harris is? Who knows who Franco Harris is? Oh my God. This one, I'm really depressed. Go ahead, tell us who Franco Harris is. He's a football player. Yeah, Franco Harris, I think for a while he had the record. The Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, those, this fifth Super Bowl that year, they won the four Super Bowls that time. They won them four of them in five years or something. They were the best team. Terry Brutch, oh, Franco Harris was a great running back. What? Push, push it down? He was at this year's Super Bowl. They yeah, announced him. Yeah. yeah, anyway, he was a great, great football player. Now, both of those, Roy Campanella was listed in his days as being a Negro, and Franco Harris is black. Okay, Roy Campanella's father was an Italian-American, and his mother was black. Franco Harris' father, I think, was, I think he met his wife in Italy. I think he was an American serviceman who met his wife in Italy. So he, she was Italian and he was American black. So why are they black and not Italians? If Italians are white, why are they black and not white? It's a social decision we make. It, it, does, it really has very little to do with anything, any sort of scientific measure of things. And race was actually invented to prove the inferiority of some people. Nobody talked about race in the 1700s. In the early 1900s, they invented races. There was the Caucasian race, the Negro race, and the Mongolian race. And they did all kinds of, ex uh, all kinds of experiments, which today, uh, if, 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 you, if they weren't so serious, you'd laugh how foolish they were, but it makes me cry, okay, to prove that the... Caucasians were the superior race, and then the Mongolians, and then the Negroes. Of course, what happened, people said, well, you're just prejudiced against skin color, which was, of course, the truth of most of the people doing this. said, no, we're not. No, we're not. So they had all kinds of other criteria. And by those criteria, people from India, who were, tend to, who were most of them were dark-skinned, right, had to be listed as Caucasians. It, it was very painful to them. Some of them even wrote out, screwed it up. <laughs> okay? But in any case, um, there have been tests throughout, IQ tests have been given, and IQ studies have been shown to prove the innate inferiority of, of blacks and Negroes. The first time it was done during World War II, it was called the Army Alpha and Beta Test, in which alpha tests were for people who were literate, beta tests were for people who were not literate. And um, 
blacks were shown to be inferior as a group to the whites. They were, uh, they were below. Then some stinker went in there and matched four, said, well, let's take most of the blacks you have in the army here are, are poor, from poor farming backgrounds in the South, and they're not literate. Let's take uh, whites in the same situation, and all of a sudden the difference went away, so they locked that in a drawer. Okay, never mind about that one. But lately, in general, since they've gone to this, when you take, when you take the IQs of blacks as a whole and whites as a whole, there, in general, is a standard deviation difference. The blacks are one standard deviation below. And this proves the racial, genetic inferiority of black people. Before we go on, let me tell you something. If we make a line and we t take, we put a person from every ethnic group that has been proven to be inferior by IQ tests, okay? So this ethnic group, we have one person from that group, this ethnic group, and we put them in a line by the date at which the IQ test said they were innately inferior, the black person would have to be toward the back of the line, okay? During the great migrations from the 1880s to the 1920s into America, okay, there was a great migration here to the U.S. from Southern and Eastern Europe. How many people here are descendants of that migration? Italians, Poles, uh, not too many. If I went to, I had a person in the booth. If, we, if this were in the north, in the north Midwest or the Northeast, we'd have we'd have 60 percent of the hands up. Okay, 40 years ago we'd have 80. We'd have 50, at one point in America in the 1960s, 50 percent of the people in the United States were descendants of, of people who had come from Eastern. Now, of course, we've had people immigrate from Latin America and from Asia, so it's less, but it's a millions. It's tens of millions. It's probably 100 million people in the United States, okay? We had millions of people coming from Italy and from Poland and from Russia and from Greece. As those people got off the boats after the IQ tests were invented, at the, at the second half of that migration, in the early 1900s, they were given IQ tests. And these IQ tests proved that all of them were genetically, innately inferior people. And in the 70s, 70% 70 of them were retarded. In 1924, when they shut down immigration in America, immigration in America was shut down from the 1920s to the 1960s, okay, not completely, but a, a lot. Basically, they said, we're going to spend immigration on the percentage of people from a given country in 1890, which basically meant the people from Eastern and Southern Europe were cut off, right? Most of them, okay? The scientific, I'm putting scientific in quotes, testimony before Congress in the 1920s, I think it was 1924, 1925, when they made the law, was from IQ tests showing the innate inferiority. If we let these people in and they're going to breed with the rest of America, if we let any more, we'll have inferior intellectual stock. Never mind that the vast majority of the public universities in the Northeast and in the Northern Midwest, even the Middle Midwest, but in the more than was Chicago, Milwaukee, and Baltimore, New York, and Philadelphia, where most of these people had gone. Never mind that most of the people there, most of the outstanding students there, were from these immigrants. Okay? Never mind that we had to impose quotas to keep some of these immigrants out of, like Harvard, they had quotas against Jews. Because if you just went on qualifications, Jews were, would get in there more than they wanted. Okay? So that, and by the way, by the way, if you're from Irish background, you're, you're lucky because most of the Irish got here before they had the tests, okay? And this was all based on bigotry and prejudice. By the way, it's tremendous prejudice against the Irish. And when they, you could get ads for houses or for jobs, and at the end of the ad, there would be this. I know this is not psychology, but I'm going to teach it to you anyway. It's sociology. It would say this. No Irish need apply. We don't want Irishmen around here, okay? There was something, okay, come back to me. What didn't America, what didn't most Americans like about the Irish? There was something horrible about them. Push it down. They were Catholics. They were Catholics. This was the great bastion of Protestants. How did you know that? I'm Catholic and I've heard that in plenty of history classes. Yeah, good for you. Hated it. All of a sudden, these millions of Catholics. This was a great bastion of Protestantism. In 1960, when John Kennedy ran for president, the first Catholic, uh, no, the second Catholic to run for president on, uh, 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 on a major party, right? 
he actually came down to Dallas to talk to Protestant ministers to convince him he wouldn't let the Pope run the country. This was 1960. It was America first. It was unbelievable. And some of the people said it was a very close election with Nixon. It was basically a, t a tie. Okay? And some people said if he had been a Protestant, he would have won by a lot. A lot of people meant I'm not voting for any papist. That was the nasty word that you called a Catholic, right? Okay? These people who came, they were even, but at least the Irish had one redeeming quality. They spoke English. These people who came, they were also Catholics from Eastern Europe. They weren't Catholic. They were Greek Orthodox or Jews. And they couldn't speak English. They were awful. There was tremendous bigotry and prejudice against them. So you pull out the IQ tests. These tests have been used forever to discriminate against people. And then along came the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> pull it out to discriminate against blacks, right? They're no good either. They're genetically inferior people. I, I just don't know what to say. I will tell you the following. The statistics that were used, there was a famous article by Jensen in 69, the Harvard Ed Review. The analysis was awful. On top of that, what you have is you have to remember, right, that in general, poverty depresses IQs. We know darn well that the education that goes on in poor schools for recent, I, I'll get to when we get to Piaget, is just not the same education we get in middle class schools. Therefore, since these IQ tests are full of achievement items, full of achievement items, kids' IQs are worse. Okay? And as a matter of fact, people have said, you know what? As you go up socioeconomic levels, okay, the black IQs get closer and closer to, to the IQs of the general populace, okay? Until finally, and of course it doesn't take into effect. For instance, you have to remember that in the 50s when they started to do this, there was a tremendous disruption in the whole black community. There was a vast migration from the south to the north. That's what they were picking up with the immigrants, okay? Most of the people who engaged in that migration were extremely poor. Just like most of the immigrants who came to America were extremely poor and uneducated, I might add. Okay? And then there were tremendous disruptions. Black came up for jobs that were disappearing. In New York, you could go to New York and get manufacturing jobs, and the mass black immigration to New York came at the time when manufacturing jobs were dried up. There was a tremendous uh, 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 social disturbances in the black community at the time when they began to give these tests. In any case, people began to say, okay, I'll tell you what. Let's go to the top and take upper socioeconomic levels. And there was still a difference between black and IQ and white IQ, but smaller. The trouble is, is the term socioeconomic status. It has the same problem as IQ, the same thing as grades. It's a mishmash of all kinds of stuff. So, for instance, there was a time in America where teachers would have to be by the pay they had. They used to have six categories. This one teacher, lower, lower class, upper, lower class, lower middle class, upper middle class, lower, upper class. Those were people who were filthy rich, but they had to work for a living in upper, upper class. They just lived off their inheritance. Right? Teachers were in the upper, lower class based on their salary. Now in some places they still are, <laughs> some of them, are. but here they're not. But because they had a college degree, they got bumped up to the lower middle class. Okay, so it's a mishmash of education and of money and of this and of that. And so if you if you if you look at the black middle class, right, that emerged after um, some of the op some opportunities began to open in the '60s, it was a typical emergence of, of immigrants, right? When immigrants came, where did they go? They went into civil service jobs. That's the old, or the Irish cop, right? They opened up small businesses, right? And they, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, which sometimes grew into big businesses. But people who first entered the middle class, most of them didn't do it by education, okay? But most of them said, I didn't go to college, but you're going to. A friend of mine, his father didn't have a college education, and he managed to, and he sold insurance for a living, and my friend was a great baseball player. We used to have, when we played baseball at camp, if the ball hit the top of the hill and rolled down to the dining hall, it was on medic home run. Steve used to hit him over the dining hall. And he got a letter from the Cardinals to come for a tryout. His father said, no point in going. You'll never make the team. He said, what do you mean I won't win? How do you know? He said, how can you make the team with two broken arms? 
He said, two broken arms. I said, I said yeah, if you don't go to college, I'm breaking both your arms, right? So, you're going to college. I didn't have the opportunity, but now I came from, his father grew up very poor, right? But I got in the middle because you're going to college. And Steve said, my father knew I wasn't good enough to be a pro player. I was good, but I wasn't good enough to, at the time, right? So I said, what we need to see is we need to have a generation of blacks who went to college and whose kids are going to college, okay? And then let's see how their IQs are compared to, because it's just achievement stuff, right? They have a middle class, they come from a middle class family, and they're, right, and now they're in the middle class and they're going to college and they got a standard education, right? I said, now let's see what happens to the IQ difference. I hate to tell you, I told you so. No, I don't. I told you so. There's no difference. These tests are used to dig and to squirm at people. They, their, their social impacts are enormous, and that's true today now on an individual basis, right? Being used to push and pull people around in an attempt to kind of social engineer or to make social or to justify institutions the way they are, okay? And that's what I want to talk about next. It's going to go into the next tape for those of you who are taking it by tape. Uh, I'm sorry about it. Let's go to, okay, now, recently, recently, don't, don't get here yet, don't go here yet. I gotta find that I didn't rearrange these tapes yet. Recently there has been a change, there's been an attempt to, ch there's been a realization that what was said about these tests, okay, has caught on. After all these years, let's go back to the PowerPoint, after all these years, of using these tests to label kids and push them around, okay, the IQ people have realized, come back to me for a second, that most of what I have said is correct. Okay, they've acknowledged it. There's no theory behind what they have. They'll say, test is a theoretical. It's not clear what they measure. We don't know what's going on. So this WISC-4 that I held to the camera before, the new Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children version four, Right, there was the WISC and the WISC R, WISC Revised and WISC 3, now the WISC 4, has attempted to bail out by doing the following. They have attempted to use, okay, let's go to the PowerPoint, a new scoring system, sort of. They've conceded that what they did before is no good. I just have to tell you, I sent to one, get my picture in there if you can. I said to one person, so are you ready to concede that, you, that everything you did before, that the kids you labeled retarded and learning disabled and everything based on these tests are, that it was all wrong and you need to apologize to all those parents? He told me to get out of his office, basically. Okay. Rather than basing their views of intelligence on, children, on the conception of how children think and learn, that, rather than saying, okay, look, we made a mistake, let's do a think and learn, they've opted to try a new statistical technique to bail them out of their problems. Okay, it's, call, it's called factor analysis. And they claim that they have a theory when in fact they, they don't have a true theory based on understanding of learning development. Come back to me and I'm not going to explain to you factor analysis in a way that will make a statistician come and write and scream in my face and put me in a deep dark dungeon for 20 years. Okay, factor analysis basically what they did is they took these tests and it measures what answers are given together. So most of the people who got this one right got this one right. Most people got this one wrong, got this one wrong. They cluster together. They call, they're called factors. Anybody know what factor analysis is? Oh, I see the look on your face. God, I, because I, I can't explain it too well without showing you the formulas and all this stuff, which I don't know too well either. But factor analysis basically says, let's see which people tend to, people tend to, which cases come to cluster together. Everyone who gets this right gets this right, gets this right, gets this right, or most people. There's a very high correlation between them. Some of you have a negative correlation. People get this right and this right and this right, tend not to get that one right. And they get certain factors that come out, right? So for instance, most people who say, most people who say that I'm opposed to abortion are for lower taxes, I'm just making this up, are for lower taxes, are for are for uh, states' rights, are for term limits. And I say, oh, that's a conservative factor, okay? Most people who say we should have a government subsidy for televisions, 
for buying televisions, are the people who say I spend 17 hours a day watching sports, are the people who say I send my kid to the Little League and to the Pop Warner League and to this and that. Oh, that's a sports factor, right? I want to stop seeing television so I could see sports, right? Most people say, right? So they got out certain factors here. I don't want to go into And then what they say is we don't even look at total IQ anymore. Well, of course, they do. They have to because otherwise the whole conception of learning disability goes away, which we'll see soon. But we have factors that we use, okay? And what they found out, here, let's go back to the PowerPoint, whoops, is that some of the original tests, like information, arithmetic, okay, and arithmetic, didn't, it can correlate with anything. They were sort of sitting out there. And whatever scores you got on another test had nothing to do with these tests. So they left them in there, but they said, we don't use that for calculating IQ anymore. They made up a few new tests, picture concepts, letter numbering sequence. They made up a few new tests, okay, and put those in the total IQ. And I'll just give you a little short idea of what's on these new tests, okay? So the first one, picture concepts, Okay, come back to me. I've got it labeled here somewhere. You know what these all are. You've all seen them. Okay. In other words, you know what they are. You know better if I told you, right? A picture concept is like, um, it looks like my label fell out. Let's go to another one until I find it. Okay. Here, let's go to number seven. Letter number sequencing. See number seven? Letter number sequencing says like this, okay? Um, I'm going to give you a group of numbers, come back to me, and letters. After I say them, I want you to tell me the numbers first in order, starting with the lowest number, then tell me the letters in alphabetical order. So if I say um, 6Z, 9T, nine, nine right? Three. N, you have to give me 369 and BNT, ZT, whatever, okay? What does that measure? I have no idea. Okay, so that's one. Another one, um, <clears throat> another one they do is symbol search. What they do is it's, it's sort of a, um, <clears throat> they show you a bunch of nonsense symbols. Okay, they show you here, I'll show you on here. They show you this, they show you, right? And then over here, they show you another bunch of symbols and they ask you, wait. And over here they show you one symbol and they say, does this symbol appear over here? You have to say yes or no. If this is a measure of intelligence, it has nothing to do with what I think is intelligent. It was, oh, it shows attention to detail, right? You'll notice, by the way, that this has here, let me show you, come back to the PowerPoint, right? This is, re obviously, it's replaced picture completion. They want to show attention to detail, which didn't, which didn't correlate with any of the, which didn't fall in with any, so they had to find something else that gave you a factor that correlated with other tests, okay? Et cetera, et cetera. Matrix reasoning, you know how that is. They show you a circle this way. Come back to me so you can see it better. They show you a circle this way. Then th Wait, here, I'll show you. I'll draw it for you. Let's go here. They show you, come back to the tablet, this way, then this way, then this way, and you're supposed to know the next one's this way, right? Of course, I never ask you for your reasoning if you give a different one. These are the kinds of things that they put in more tests. I mean, I don't know what these measure. And they claim now, what they claim is, Come back to me now. Since, since they have, since they have, get these things to intercorrelate. So they'll get one, and they'll say this correlates with this. Oh, this is a, this is a, a short-term memory one. Oh, this is a speed of processing one. How fast you do things, right? Because the ones in which you're timed, people who the ones in which you're timed, the people who do well on one seem to do well on the other. Okay, this is a of this, and then they make up what they call these factors. Now, they have never researched to see whether it's really true. Do these people really think about things faster in a real situation? 
Do these people really pay attention to detail when it's important to real situation? By the way, sometimes it's not important to pay attention to detail. And they say, now we have a theory because we have a factor analysis. You don't have a theory. All you have is this bunch of random questions you made up, and you found a statistical artifact that some of them tend to clump together. The answers tend to clump together across the tests. That's not a theory. It's just a statistical analysis. Let me say it once more. It's not a theory. If you have a bunch of, if you find certain things happen together and don't happen together, and you don't know why, it's not a theory. And if you claim, oh, because these things happen together, this kid has a really good short-term memory, you have to prove that those tests really are indicative of short-term memory. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just because I give a test that seems to test that doesn't mean that it really does. If I give you a nonsense task and it seems to say, oh, gee, you can remember fast, you can do it fast because you can remember what all the nonsense symbols are, that doesn't mean that's, you have to prove that that really affects how real people are functioning with their memories in the real world. And I can say, this kid has a beautiful memory for meaninglessness. For meaningfulness, the kid has no memory. These are just, what are these tasks? What do they prove? What do they show? And interestingly enough, you'll notice that things like information and arithmetic, real knowledge, they, didn't, they had no connection to any of the other tests. And we're left with all the same problems that I identified before. Okay? All these eight problems. Now, in the time I have left, because we were supposed to finish this there, said so I'm not going to, let's go back to the PowerPoint. I want to talk about the labeling game. The labeling game, LD, retarded, slow learner, etc., all of these labels are the result of scores on IQ and other standardized tests, not measures of thinking or neurological testing. Okay? When, you, when a parent is told, come back to me, when a parent is told, we tested your child, and your child is learning disabled, and that means your child has a neurological problem. There is as much evidence for that as we tested your child, your child has a learning problem, and it's because there are a little, there's elves, there are elves on the moon shooting down beams into your child's head. There's as much evidence for the beams as there is for neurological, pro neurological problems. We're told something's wrong in the kid's brain without ever testing a kid's brain. You can't do that if you're a scientist. And in order to label a kid LD, despite the fact that the WISC people now tell you, and the school psychologist will now tell you, well, we don't go with total IQ. We just look at these factors, these, these abilities that seem to come out or these abilities that we think we have, you know, what questions come together. They still have to calculate total IQ, okay? Let me, um, let me, uh, let's go to back to the PowerPoint. Franz Kafka talked about circular, circular reasoning, right? Circular explanations. He says, just because your doctor has a name for your condition doesn't mean he knows what it is. That's circular reasoning, okay? Did I tell you about my aunt and uncle arguing on the porch? Did I tell you about that? Okay, come back to me. Um, when I was living in Israel, I have a lot, big family in Israel, and my aunt and uncle, this was in the 70s, um, he was very much on the right in Israeli politics, and she was very much on the left in Israeli politics. Okay, so I, uh, and so when the family would get together, we would have a rule. We're together in his house, because he's the husband of the oldest sister, right? We had a rule. Don't talk politics or they'll start screaming at each other. So we're talking, we're talking about family, we're talking about this and the family in America, half the family's in America and half was in Israel. I don't know what's going on, you know, it depends on where they could run when the communists chased them out of Russia, all right? What's going on and what's happening? And that's so we said, oh, let's watch the news. We're all thinking, oh no, here we go. Turn on the six o'clock news, something comes on, the two of them start to argue. They're arguing, they're screaming at each other. Yelling. So me with my big mouth, I couldn't take it. So I go out on the porch. I'm going to stand up, right? Go out on the porch, and I'm reading a newspaper. If 
five minutes later, my uncle comes out and he's like this. He's, can you see me? He's like this. Going up and back, up and back, up and back. Steamy. Finally, he turns around to me and says, my uncle wrote books. He wrote some math books. He wrote books on history. He was a real intellectual. He goes, he says, what are you reading for? I said, huh? He said, don't read the newspaper. Right? That's like a nutritionist telling you, don't eat healthy foods, right? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you don't have to read a newspaper. You don't have to read books. You don't have to listen to the radio. You don't have to listen to television. You don't have to do anything. So I'm looking at him like this. He said, just listen to what your aunt says. Do the opposite and you'll always be right. right? <laughs> That's what I'm telling you about learning disabilities. Just look at what learning disability does. Do the opposite and you'll be a pretty good scientist. They make just about every mistake you can make. Next time we'll look into them, how they're circular, how they make contentions without evidence, and how in the end they torture children. There, okay, we'll talk about it, okay?